we're here on the directive of the president to ensure that the children are safely returned back to their destinations. Federal High Court strikes out treason charge against August nationwide protesters as federal government withdraws case. From now and going into the future, we will heavily, we will heavily focus on practical training. Federal government reviews 18 years entry age into tertiary institutions. Share your perspective on why you took the time to be here this evening and why this election is important to you. Let everyone think it's going to be tight as hell, but whether it is or not doesn't matter. You have to go out and we have to swamp them. Election day in America. Voters troop out to determine 47th president. Hello and a warm welcome to NTA Network News. We'll begin with the judiciary as the charges of alleged conspiracy, treasonable felony and disruption of public peace filed against 150 young persons in the wake of the August nationwide protest have been struck out by the Federal High Court Abuja. Justice Obiara Eguatu discharged the defendants based on a motion for discontinuance of the trial filed by Director of Public Prosecution of the Federation. Muhammad Abubakar, on behalf of the Attorney General and Minister of Justice Latik Fabemi, SAN. The Justice Ministry took over the case in line with its powers in Section 174 of the 1999 Constitution of Nigeria as amended safely return back to their destinations and before we return them we want to do also due, I mean, due process of ensuring that they are medically fit so we, we take them for safekeeping in the facility and make sure they are medically checked and where we need to make additional treatment we we'll take care of them. Again we are calling on the government to discontinue all cases pending in different states with respect to the August protest. Justice Iguatu receiving no objection from the defense counsel granted the request and dismissed the charges. He further ordered the immediate release of these defendants from prison remand. President Tinibu had on Monday directed the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice to terminate the trial by dropping charges against them and facilitate the release of the defendants, most of whom are said to be minors. In the meantime, Vice President Kashim Shetima has handed over 119 minors and adults after the presidential directive on the unconditional release of the alleged protesters of August 2024 nationwide protest. Now let's take a listen to State House correspondent Abdurrahman Jubrila's report. <laughs> These are the 119 minors and other alleged August 2024 protesters that were pardoned by President Bola Tinibu on humanitarian grounds. Regardless, the President has used his position in the power of the nation to give these young men another chance at becoming responsible citizens who will make a positive impact in their life for a better life. Nigeria. I would like to admonish you, young men, not to allow you yourself to be used in perpetrating violence and destroying public and private property. Over 300 billion naira was lost in the protest, consisting mainly of private property through looting and loss of business. I will urge you, I will advise you, you are our children, to use the opportunity of the President's magnanimous gesture in ensuring that you go back home and become responsible citizens who will contribute to the growth of the society. The released protesters who were earlier arraigned by the Nigerian police force and discharged by the Federal High Court sitting in Abuja. Here at the State House, Vice President Kashim Shetima officially hands them over to the governors of Kaduna and Kanwa states. We will continue to be in our minds 
The president has shown his compassion. He has shown his humility. And he has shown that you are also his children. Of course, sir, but uh, what I'm impressed about, they're all in high spirit, all of them. You can see that uh, they have promised me, as their governor, that uh, they will be of good character. And of course, they also agree with me that uh, they will not uh, participate again in anything uh, similar to what happened in the past. The released defendants are expected to undergo medical checks before they will be handed over to their families. From the State House, Abraham Jibrila, NTA News. Now, to talk more on that, let's bring in May Nasara Umar Kogo. He is the chairman of the Code of Conduct Tribunal. He is also a seasoned constitutional lawyer and analyst in the field of law, security, economy, politics, and international diplomacy. You're welcome to Network News. No, thank you very much. Now, let's have your thoughts on the you know, federal government's decision to the release of the arrested August nationwide protesters, knowing fully well the, the uproar it caused when they were arraigned in court. Let's have your thoughts there. Well, that singular decision has succeeded in coming down the frenzy uh, uproar that uh, the nation witnessed over uh, a few days ago. And I must commend the swift way with which the Attorney General and the Honorable Minister of Justice acted relating to the President's directive. Uh, under sections 147, 150, and 174 of the Constitution, the Attorney General has done the needful within the ambience of the limitation of time. I think he needs to be commended by that. And the President, over and above anything, has demonstrated quintessential disposition of highest degree of statesmanship and the feel of the pulse of the nation. Under the section 130 of the Constitution, as the Chief Executive Officer of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, we must commend the President for really saving uh, 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 the, 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 the situation based on the frenzy nature of the situation before his pronouncement. And the President has really shown that he, the psyche of the nation, uh, you know, he feels whatever is going on within the country. And I think is highly commendable. It's a rare situation where you see the president coming in uh, to make this type of pronouncement, but it is abundantly clear that it is under the respect of section 14, subsection 1 of the constitution that says sovereignty belongs to the people. He has shown that under the renewed hope agenda, his government is listening to whatever the people are saying and he is ready to really entrench the supremacy of the people's interests and aspirations regarding whatever he is doing in the governance of the nation. I think the president needs to be commended. Yes, for that. he needs to be commended. He, the people have spoken, the president has listened with his humane, with this immune act and now apart from their release government is saying it's going to rehabilitate them now what impact will this gesture have on their future their parents and the community and what advice do you have to parents of these children it's development of uh, better citizens for the future uh, you know no nation can have a future leaders better than the citizens it breeds at the younger taller uh, age uh, of, of their development and when you take the provision of the Constitution under sections 21, 23, and 24, every citizen has a duty to partake in making the governance of the country better. And as a result of which, everybody is a member of the government. And the parents, too, most importantly, need to tame the excesses of the young people. Uh, members of the social media, too, need to know the bounds of their limitation, especially going about, going sensationalizing it along some uh, uh, paramodial considerations that is contrary to sections 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 21, 23, and 24. I think the gospel of national unity, national progression, national cohesion, and uh, interest of participating in the governance should be up and above any other consideration. By the time children are allowed to go and maim and destroy public properties, including properties of innocent citizens. Uh, definitely speaking, we are not breeding them for better leaders in the future. It is very, very important uh, parents and elder statesmen, wherever they are, to be the gospels of uh, moral rectitude, to try as much as possible to be injecting discipline and statesmanship in the minds of the young people so that ultimately they will be the future leaders that will run the country. Uh, the president has spoken, uh, the governors too, I commend them, they have spoken very well. It is very 
very, very important to the parents, the traditional rulers, uh, the religious and community leaders. Everybody should come on board. Everybody has a responsibility to shape the future generations that will govern Nigeria, bearing in mind little, little drops of water makes a mighty ocean. We need the much mighty ocean of unity, cohesion, uh, solidarity, and statesmanship to be entrenched in the Federation of Nigeria. Minister Umar Koko is chairman of the Code of Conduct Tribunal. Thank you so much for your insight into this issue that has, you know, brought a lot of, you know, cries to homes in Nigeria. And I hope these children will be able to rehabilitate themselves as government continues to do that. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you very Thank much you for, for your having time. Now, talking security matters, as the government continues to tackle the multi-dimensional security issues in the country, President Bola Tinibu has assured the military that his administration would always listen to their advice and keep the country on the path of peace and prosperity. President Bola Tinibu made the commitment as he decorated the acting chief of army staff, Olufemi Oliede, to a new rank of lieutenant general. State House correspondent Musbao Nawahap reports. In the absence of the indisposed Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Tarit Lagbaja, Olufemi Oluyede is the man in charge. He came in a major general, but then his present position requires an elevation. As approved by the Commander-in-Chief and Chairman Defense Council, the Acting Chief of Army Staff is now a Lieutenant General. This was an opportunity for President Bola Tinubu once more to commend the military for the success so far, unwavering courage, dedication, patriotism and synergy amongst the forces in maintaining the nation's security. And we need that stability to assure the citizen that prosperity is not far away from them. The president assured the military of continuous government support as they continue to take the fight to the enemies of state. We have no other country but this. And we owe a responsibility to our children and great children to come to hand over a nation that is a banner without stain. We are committed to that. I do everything possible to encourage your men and women in the service. The onslaught against all forms of insecurity is the on in part of a country as the officers in charge steps in. But having been part of several operations, the acting chief of army staff assures of commitment to the cause of safeguarding the nation. So what I intend to do is to continue with the philosophy of the Chief of Army Staff, Lieutenant General Chia Lagwaja, and give my very best to make sure that I support, you know, in collaboration with other security agencies and sister agencies, to bring all forms of criminality to the highest minimum, and to warn all the criminals out there that, you know, nobody has monopoly of violence besides those of us in uniform, and they should be ready to have that. Lieutenant General Olufemi Olatumbosun Oluyede from Ekiti State was granted regular combatant mission as second lieutenant as a member of the 39 regular course 1992 with seniority in the same rank effective from September 1987. He participated in several operations including the Economic Community of West African State Monitoring Group ECOMOG mission in Liberia. Operation Harmony 4 in Bakasi and Operation Hadin Kai in the Northeast. From the State House, Muspao, then Wahab, NC News. Meanwhile, leaders from Bayelsa State have commended President Bola Tinibu for what qualifies for fair treatment of the Ijo nation, including the appointment of one of their own, Esther Wilson Jack, as the head of the civil service of the Federation. The delegation led by Governor Doe Diri came on a special thank you visit to the president at the State House. Against let's get the report of Musba Wahab, our State House correspondent. Hi, Didi. Didi Esther Walson Jack rose through the ranks and became the number one civil servant in Nigeria in August 2024. 
The 21st Head of Civil Service of the Federation and fifth woman to get to this pinnacle is from Bielsa State. Her position is one of the strategic ones being held by members of the Ijo Nation. Certainly, her people are not taking this for granted, going by the roll call of Ijo leaders here. We say thank you. Bielsa is also one of the benefiting states of the 700-kilometer Lagos Calabar Superhighway and other federal infrastructure projects, including the Brass Natural Gas, East West Road, among others. But then, the state is still hoping for more support and partnership of the federal government on infrastructure development. Since you came on board, you have been very proactive to ensure that those who are affected by flood are immediately attended to. And in fact, as a state government, we received large sums of money from this government to help us in ameliorating the flood. I have a report here that has been tagged environmental genocide, counting the human and environmental costs of oil exploration and exploitation in Bielsa State. We will, sir, ask for your support in ensuring that the recommendations of this commission are all implemented. Well, if you say thank you, I take it. <laughs> Appreciation accepted, but while he promises a more rewarding partnership with the state, the president assures Nigerians that he is not losing focus on the re-engineering of the economy for a more prosperous nation. We are going to economic twist and turn. We just have to collaborate and, you know, put hands together to do just infrastructures that are necessary to encourage the economic development and prosperity of our various sections of this country. And that is what we're doing. I'm glad you noticed the uh, effort on the coastal road. The economic importance and the future of this country on that coastal line will surpass you and I. But we just have to invest and invest aggressively. President Bola Tinubu also commended Governor Jiri for his commitment to good governance in Bayosa State. From the State House, Musbao, Dan Wahab, NC News. Vice President Kashim Shetima has reaffirmed Nigeria's commitment to addressing its growing nutrition challenges through a community-driven strategy aimed at transforming nutrition outcomes across Nigeria's 774 local government areas. He gave the commitment during a meeting with high-level delegation from the World Bank Group while presenting the comprehensive N774 initiative which builds on successful outcomes from the accelerating nutrition results in Nigeria project. He explained that the N774 initiative is a localized, community-driven solution tailored towards the unique needs of each local government and aims to bring nutrition interventions directly to the communities while encouraging local ownership and ensuring sustainability. The country director of the World Bank, India Media, thanked the Vice President for his leadership in coordinating multi-stakeholder collaboration in setting agenda on nutrition issues in public discourse. He added that it is important to see Nigeria's ongoing financing efforts for nutrition and announced that World Bank has earmarked $50 million on the Anrin 2.0 program, which is a crisis response window. NTN News will continue in a moment. Don't go away. The Minister of Information and National Orientation, Mohammed Idris, says Tinibu administration is implementing more financial support towards alleviating the pains and challenges being experienced on account of the bold economic reforms aimed at putting Nigeria back on the track of sustainable growth and prosperity.
Now, this was at a town hall engagement in Abuja with beneficiaries of federal government loans for micro, small and medium enterprises operators. Salu Abdullahi Gwanara tells us more. Like the Nigerian Education Loan Fund, the Credit Cost Scheme, and the 200 billion Naira initial funding for consumer credit cooperation, the Presidential Grant and Loan Scheme for Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises is set to distribute 75 billion Naira as loans to Nigerians. The goal is to further diversify the Nigerian economy, create jobs, promote value addition, revitalize our communities and boost our exports. We fully recognize that these reforms may have caused some temporary hardship, especially for the vulnerable population. And we will do everything, this government and men will do everything within its power to cushion that discomfort. These simple digit loan facilities will be complemented by the ongoing tax reforms designed to reduce the tax burden on Nigerian businesses. This is in line with the administration's target to transform Nigeria into a trillion dollar economy by the year 2026. The government image maker assured that no part of the country will be left behind and that all Nigerians are potential beneficiaries. Once you put your application and your applications are judged to be in conformity with the rules and regulations set out, you will indeed be a beneficiary of this. There is no need for I know someone. There is no need for connection. You apply, you get. Similar town hall meetings are being held across the six geopolitical zones of the country. In Abuja, Salihu Abdullah Higwanara, NTA News. Now let's talk health matters as Nigeria's health outcomes have been observed to be challenging with high rates of maternal and child mortality reflecting persistent gaps in healthcare access and quality. The country also faces low utilization of primary healthcare services, underscoring the need for comprehensive reforms to improve service delivery, expand healthcare access and strengthen Nigeria's primary healthcare system. The Federal Ministry of Health has risen to the challenge. Under the leadership of the Coordinating Minister of Health and Social Welfare, Professor Muhammad Ali Pati, who is driving the transformation of the nation's health sector, focused on advancing a comprehensive agenda to strengthen the system, accelerating progress towards universal health coverage that aligns with national health policies and the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. Now, these reforms have been captured under the National Health Sector Renewal Initiative that utilizes the sector-wide approach that unites MDAs, development partners, and private sector players to enhance effectiveness in healthcare delivery. A key component of these is the one plan, one conversation, one budget, and one M&E process. This year's joint annual review is an opportunity for health stakeholders health sector stakeholders to access program performance, evaluate resources, distribution, and review outcomes. Now, joining me in the studio is the Coordinator Minister of Health and Social Welfare, Professor Mohamed Alipati. He served as Minister of State for Health in 2011, as well as the Executive Director, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. He also had a stint as Professor of Public Health Leadership, Harvard University, and at Duke University, all in the USA. You're welcome to NTA Network News. Thank you for having me. It's nice having you. And Prof, you're hosting the health sector's first joint annual review, along with all 36 states' health commissioners, donors, and development partners. And the key plan of, of, of this event is one plan, one conversation, one budget, and one M and E process. What would this achieve? Can you just tell us about that? Well, under the leadership of Mr. President, uh, his administration has embarked on ambitious reforms, which were launched last year. And the federal government signed a compact with all state governors, local governments, development partners, as well as civil society, for us to respond to Nigeria's citizens' needs as it relates to health and to improve population health outcomes, to do better in investing in those things that attend to the needs of our most poorest, 
and vulnerable populations, our women, our children, who are the future of this country, who will fit into the prosperity that is in this country's future. But as part of that effort, governance is key. And that requires us to be transparent, to be accountable, and to use good information, good data, to take stock of the progress. Now, a year on, we have called on this first joint annual sector review to look at the progress that has been made, to take stock of what has worked well and where we need improvement. And we have very good data from the DHS survey, which had looked at 46,000 households and evaluated the state of health of Nigerians, but also a public perception survey where 2,600 Nigerians were asked their perception, their confidence, what is going well and what needs to be improved. It's an iterative process. But as we learn from that, we will continue to refine the journey, ultimately to achieve the objective that we set for the reform agenda. And we're seeing some elements of good news. Early, but still, children's health has begun to improve if you compare DHS 2018 to the DHS that was conducted by October, November, December 2013. Modest, but we have also seen reduction in certain key elements, diarrheal diseases lower respiratory infections, HIV. This is based on rigorous data, independently collected. But in terms of the perception survey, we've also seen the confidence of Nigerians has been revived. And I think it's thanks to the leadership of the president and what his administration is doing across sectors in terms of the ability of the government to respond to emergencies. We're seeing more confidence in terms of the quality. It's not yet there fully, but we're seeing signals that shows the confidence is returning in terms of direction of the health sector. We're also seeing increase in access to healthcare service based on this survey instrument. Tubercul I mean, uh, hypertension, diabetes, uh, certain cancer screenings. But we're also seeing not so good news. Less women are going for mammography, which is important to screen for breast cancer, for instance. We're also seeing that the increase in access to healthcare is coming at a cost that is burdensome to families. So financial risk protection is an area that we have to work on. We have seen increase in insurance coverage, mostly public health insurance. 2.4 million Nigerians through NHIA, through the state health insurance, have had increased uh, have had coverage to afford health care through the vulnerable groups fund. But we have not seen as much improvement in the private health insurance. That is work for us to do. We have seen improvement in use of modern contraceptives in 21 states in the country between 2018 to 2013. And we've seen doubling in at least six states. But it also means that it's a lot more that we need to do to sustain these efforts. So all in all, this effort will be put into the first state of health report that we will present to His Excellency Mr. President, to the Parliament, but also to Nigerians, so that we have this dialogue for us as a nation to co-create the healthier country under the leadership of the president, but with the support of all the state governors, the local governments, the partners that are supporting the Nigerian government, civil society, and to respond to the needs of Nigerians. Because at the end of the day, that is the focus with their health and well-being as co-part of this vision that the president has for a peaceful, prosperous, and people-oriented country into the future. But those investments have to happen now. And that's what we're working on. And this week is an important milestone for this uh, overall reform. Yes, indeed, no country can thrive without a, a vibrant health sector. And the primary health care, you know, is very, very important to dispensing of, you know, uh, health issues in Nigeria. Now, you talked about data. You talked about survey. What role does public opinion play in shaping health policies in this dispensation, especially in the area of high cost of drugs? Well, we have been expanding the functionality of our primary health care centers, retraining frontline health workers, expanding the capacity of our teaching hospitals, establishing cancer uh, infrastructure and equipment, revamping, and also expanding health insurance to ensure affordability, not only for routine services, but for complicated emergency obstetric care, like cesarean section, treatment of obstetric fistula by women who are affected by that complication. Now, all of that has to be connected with what the views, what the experiences of Nigerians, both in terms of their population health, as well as their perception of the experience they have with our health system. That's why we, we calibrated that in 2023 with a People's Voices survey, 
and here this year in 2024 with another one. In addition, we have had several engagements with civil society organizations because governance has to be inclusive for it to be effective. All voices ought to be listened to, heard, even if there are difficult decisions that government has to make because of limited resources. But with that in mind, the governance pillar of the president's health agenda really is about bringing all actors onto the table. Instead of a fragmented approach, federal government going one direction, states going another direction. Yes, states are different, and they are different within themselves, or local governments. We have to join hands together. If there's one area that Nigeria can unite, at least on health issue, wherever you are, whatever level of government you function, health affects you. And that's what the president is trying to use, in fact, to help heal and unify, but also advance this vision that we can have a healthier, more prosperous country if we invest in the health of our people. And we don't leave anyone behind, our women, those who are poor, that they should afford the most basic healthcare services. And that's what we are working on. And the journey has started. We are far from where we need to be, and we are not perfect in the way we are executing it, but we are determined to diligently execute this reform agenda to achieve the results that improves the health outcomes of Nigerians over time. So how, how are the subnationals keen into this? Very interesting, because they all signed onto the compact and appointed desk officers in each of the states. Their annual operational plans have been developed uh, with the federal government, so that we have one plan, in a way, which is comprising of all the plans of the states, aligned with priorities that we set for our country, so that our development partners are not setting the priorities. We set our priorities and they key in. In addition, the resources that domestically state governments are put in, local governments will put in, federal government puts in, and the president has increased the resources in 2024 to health, and we expect that increase to be sustained and, in fact, further increased in the years ahead, along with development partners, so that they also identify where there are gaps that are aligned with our priorities. And if they go outside that, then they are distracting us. So with that in mind, we also have to keep track of the performance because you cannot focus on the investment side without looking at what results are we buying for Nigerians. Mm. It is that approach that has informed this first ever joint annual health sector-wide review that is happening this week. It has never happened and is an important milestone. But it's also one that challenges us because right now we're seeing that there is an uh, element of progress, but we need to sustain it and to keep it up. Indeed, now, is states are learning. Yeah. And we have scorecard for each state in terms of how they have been, and we will learn from those who are doing well. For those who may not be doing well, they can learn from those who are doing well and collectively improve, not judge each other, but really work towards improving the delivery of services for our population. Indeed, the challenges are surmountable, you know, and I, I believe Nigeria can get to the highest level according to world best practice in the health sector. Thank you so much, Minister of State, Minister of Health, for, uh, and social welfare professor Mohammed Ali Party. Thank you so much for you explaining to us what this review is all about. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Moving on, the federal government has announced the reduction of the minimum university admission age from 18 to 16 years, a move intended to align Nigeria's educational standards with international best practice. Minister of Education Dr. Marufu Alausa revealed this during his inaugural media briefing in Abuja. Francis Udojo tells us more. Dr. Marufu Olatunji Alausa and the Minister of State Education Dr. Suwaiba Saeed Ahmad said the review is expected to transform entry pathways into tertiary institutions, enabling 16 year olds who meet the necessary academic requirements to pursue their university ambitions sooner. From now and going into the future, we will heavily, we will heavily focus on practical training. 80% of the education will be on practical training, and 20% will be on a theoretical classroom base. Reeling out the agenda, the promised to prioritize science, engineering, medical sciences, and technical education across all educational levels, aiming to develop a skilled workforce equipped for Nigeria's future. Additionally, entrepreneurship programs will receive more support 
with universities and more funds to agriculture focused universities to implement mechanized farming, bolstering efforts towards national food security, enhance inclusivity in education, special needs students, and children from low income families will be encouraged to attend school with plans to introduce conditional cash transfers for mothers and caregivers to ease financial barriers to education. Francis Udojo, NT News. Still talking education, the National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools has announced the association's new board of directors. National President of the Association, Yomi, Yomi Otubela, who made this announcement at a press conference in Lagos, said the decision is to ensure transparency and legitimacy within the operations of private schools and enhance service delivery. Diana Ajele completes the report. For the National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools, NAPS Nigeria, it is a new dawn with the election of this new board of trustees led by Dr. Yomi Otubela as the national president, Amina Makintami, deputy national president. We need to, more than ever before, to see that we maintain the minimum standard in operating private schools in the country. The era of which where people run below the minimum standard required by government will no longer be tolerated. Other newly elected board members are Abdul Mumini Kundat, Chairman, National Association of Proprietors of Private Schools, Nigeria, Edna Okpara, Secretary, South South, Andrew Agi, National Financial Secretary, while others occupying several positions are expected to pilot the affairs of the association. The election of the new members, Chairman, Board of Trustees said, is done in accordance with the newly approved 2023 NAPS Constitution by the National Delegates Congress after a series of careful reviews based on concerns raised by NAPS. I felt congratulations to each of these esteemed officers. Their leadership progress, vision, dedication will be instrumental in strengthening our advocacy for private schools across Nigeria and tackling the challenges within the educational sector by good grace. The chairman also used the occasion to notify delegates and members from the six geopolitical zones in Nigeria about the association upcoming NAB's national conference and exhibition, Nights 2024, scheduled to hold in Calabar, the Cross River State Capital, between 20th and 21st November 2024. In Lagos, Diana Ajale, NTA News. On the international scene, it's election day in the United States of America, with former President Donald Trump and Vice President Kamala Harris vying to become the 47th president. Chukunoso Mwabuzi in this report examines one of the most keenly contested elections in the country's history. Election day voting began at about 11 GMT Tuesday morning following an extraordinary U.S. presidential race that will either make Kamara Harris the first woman president in the country's history or hand Donald Trump a comeback. As the first polling stations opened, Harris 60, Trump 78 were in the tightest and most volatile White House contest in modern times as evident in the tie recorded at New Hampshire Hamlet. Share your perspective on why you took the time to be here this evening and why this election is important to you. Encourage folks to make their voices heard. Let everyone think it's going to be tight as hell, but whether it is or not doesn't matter. You have to go out and we have to swamp them. Republican candidate Donald Trump and his vice, J.D. Vance, were one of the early voters in Florida and Ohio, of which a final outcome of the election may not be known for several days if the results are as close as the polls suggest. Tens of millions of voters are expected to cast their ballots, in addition to the more than 82 million people who have already voted early. The world is anxiously watching, as the outcome of the election will have huge implications for conflicts in the Middle East, Russia-Ukraine war, as well as on tackling climate change. Chukunan Songwa NTN News. Members of the Lake Chad Region Development Revitalization Project, PROLAC, 
development partners and other state actors of the Lake Chad Basin are currently in the city of Jamaina, Chad, for the annual International Forum on Development of the Lake Chad Basin. Elizabeth Omori reports that this year's convergence seeks to assess efforts by member states in driving stabilization of the region through governance and inclusive life-changing interventions. Sharing common goal with familiar tales, they are here to dialogue on operational solutions to address challenges of climate change, conflict, and discuss social contracts to meet the needs of women and the youths within the Lake Chad region for sustainable growth. Activities of Boko Haram terrorists, rising water levels, hunger, poverty, unemployment, and banditry are part of the multi-sectorial issues to tackle for recovery and stabilization. The other three countries are implementing their own initiatives. Under the PROLAC, at the Nigerian side, we are implementing similar initiatives that are match with theirs across the borders and beyond through the MCRP. The Lake Chad Basin Commission and the Chadian government at the forum emphasized the need to develop recommendations to nip in the board issues of development, conflict fragility and violence affecting member states. Local governance is very, very uh, important. In fact, we cannot achieve anything without the full cooperation and collaboration of uh, local governments. If we are talking about inclusivity. Donor agencies call for regional coordination, political will by governments on humanitarian aid, connectivity and crisis monitoring to open new vistas for livelihoods to thrive. Member states are expected to come up with strategies to enhance social cohesion for economic development and food security in a changing climate in the Lake Chad region. From Njamena Chad, Elizabeth Omori, NTA News. To agriculture, the livestock industry in Nigeria is rekindled back on track and it's all thanks to the creation of a brand new Ministry of Livestock Development by President Bola Tinubu. While the challenges ahead may seem daunting, the appointment of Idi Mukhtar Meha as the first ever minister brings a renewed sense of optimism and hope. In this special report, correspondent Kunle Ade explores what is in store for the new minister as he rolls up his sleeves and gets ready to hit the ground running. President Bola Tinubu may not claim to be a prophet, but his decision to establish the Ministry of Livestock Development and appoints Idi Mukhtar Meha as its first ever minister feels like it's answering a long-awaited call. The need for better support and organization in Nigeria's livestock sector has been clear for years. And experts like Jimmy Smith emphasized these at the 2023 Food and Agriculture Organization World Conference. Now, with Minister Meha at the helm, things are about to get more interesting. His and first big task is, is to revamp ministry. Nigeria's 417 grazing reserves. Once these grazing reserves are available, have no legal encumbrances, and are suitable enough for us to regress and make all the necessary amenities and fundamentals of life for the livestock to remain in one area, this is exactly what we want to do, and we believe this is a panacea a permanent solution to this problem. It is no small feat, but he is confident that with the right management, these reserves could help resolve the conflicts that have plagued the sector for years. But here is the thing, Meha knows he can do it alone. He is already reaching out, building strong partnerships with state and local governments and the private sector. Another priority on his list is animal vaccination. And here is something else he is focused on, data. Rising. Kunle Adeyeye, NTA News. Now back to our story on the U.S. election as it is D-Day in the United States of America as the nation goes to the polls to elect a new president. It is a showdown between Democratic candidate Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump of the Republican Party. Now experts and posters say the race to the White House is too close to call. But what is the general mood in the U.S., especially as it concerns the Nigerian community over there? Dr. Victor Ide okay, joins us now from Boston, Massachusetts, here in the USA. The U.S. election, you're welcome to NTA Network News, sir. 
Thank you very much for having me. The U.S. election is in full swing and it is shaping up to be a nail biter. Now, can you tell us what's the mood like in, in the U.S., you know, pertaining the next occupant of the White House? Well, what I can tell you is that, like you already, already know, it's, um, it's a nail bite. Uh, it's a, basically a cost. But, um, you know, um, so people are excited, uh, you know, that um, we're going to have a new president. But um, it's hard to tell exactly who is going to be that next president as we stand right now. Okay, key states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, which were, you know, doubled by, you know, razor margins in the 2020 election, is playing a key role in this election. Now, early voting has reached historic, you know, elections with eight, more than 80 million uh, U.S. citizens voting. What is it in for the African community, especially Nigerians? Well, you know, uh, what, it, what you have to know that most Nigerians here in America are mostly Democrats. And um, uh, if they might be... Trust me, this election is very close that it might be in few, a in few hundreds, in few thousands. So uh, the community here, the Nigerian community here, might be might make a, a whole lot of difference. And um, as it stands right now, um, towards the, the, the couple of days, uh, the wind is blowing towards the vice president, uh, Kamara Harris. So, um, so he, he, you know, it's going to be close, but... Um, she might, she might make it, you know. So um, the Nigerian community mostly, uh, the Democrats. So uh, that's the situation of things right now. So what are the, you know, top issues on voters' mind, you know, as, as this election progresses? What are the top issues that voters would love the candidates to address when well, they get to know, office? Um, uh, yes, the, the, you know, there's uh, this abortion issue, uh, women right to choose, and uh, the immigration. You know, the, the, you know, the Republicans, that they're really, Donald Trump in particular, is basically right now is anti-immigrant, you know, so um, he wants the border to be closed. And um, Democrats are saying that we are immigrant country, that we can't close the border, you know, but we can reform the, the system. So that's really where they are. And the inflation, obviously, in the cost of living, you know, so everybody, you know, it's a, it's a multiple of um, uh, issues. And uh, But I think the major two items right now is the border and the uh, freedom of women to choose. So uh, that might be uh, the deciding factor in this election. So we are still watching. I hope you voted, you voted, and I hope the process was seamless. Thank you so much for coming on Network News, I, Dr. Victor I, I Idiokwe. Okay? Because I have, my, I have my sticker on my, I have my sticker right now on my chest, uh, voted. So, yes, I uh, voted, and uh, most Nigerians, uh, one thing about Nigerians in diaspora, they are very, they don't play with their civic duty. So, uh, I can say that Nigerians here in diaspora, mostly 90% of them are already voted. So, uh, we, we know sooner or later, in the next five, six hours. Not just Nigerians in diaspora, Nigerians at home are also keenly watching the elections. Dr. Victor Ide Okoye, thank you so much for joining us on Network News. He joined us from Boston, Massachusetts, USA. We'll take another break. We'll return. Thank you. Coming up on the 5th of November, 2024, including the mitigation strategies, Tuesday Live, every week, at 10.30 p.m. Inclusive, incisive, and educative. Join us. Welcome back. Former President Mohamed Buhari has personally visited Mejukuri to commiserate with government and people of Borno State over the recent flood disaster that affected a substantial part of the state capital. While he was away from the country at the time of the tragedy, the former president had sent a high-level delegation to sympathize with the government and people of the state and made donation. Mohamed Goni reports. The president was received at Mohamed Buhari International Airport, Maiduguri, by Governor Vagana Omar Azlam, his deputy Umar Usman Kadafur, at the palace of the Shahu of Borno, Abu Karibun Umar Garbay El Kanemi. The former president said, though he was out of the country when the incident happened, he found it necessary to send a delegation to commiserate with the government and people of Borno over the tragedy that befell the state. And when we were driving here, 
the governor was trying to show me how you are overwhelmed by the flood during my military career as a governor. I could hardly imagine such disaster. The visit to Maiduguri, he said, was to personally sympathize with the state authorities and the victims over the tragedy, praying Allah to avoid reoccurrence of the calamity. Governor Wagana Omar Azilim and Shoho Borno were full of praises to the former president for his continued support and show of affection to the people of Borno, noting some of the developmental projects executed in the state during the reign of the former president. We shall we then entirely grateful to you for all the good things that you have done to the good people of Borno State. During your tenure, Your Excellency, you establish a cast power front that we are using it now. Otherwise, Borno State could have been perfect. That's it on the news tonight. Thanks so much for your time. I am Jumai Yosef. <laughs>